You can hear me? Let's see, if I play something with sound. Hey, you know what's better than a $5,000 PC? Okay. There's so many things you have to do to get set up, it's crazy. I've never messed around with streaming or anything. Hey, Nick. And Bo. Howdy. Howdy. Okay, now we're streaming in here, and looks like my camera will die soon, that sucks. It's plugged into power, oh well, can't care that much, just making stuff, so. Okay. Anyone who's watching, please let me know if the iPad stops streaming, because I don't have a great way to see that. Maybe I can pop this out so I can only see. Okay. I'm going to be going over environment sketching over the next few months probably and we're going to go over everything that, that involves so environment sketching is something that will lead into well it's a necessary fundamental that leads into bigger things. It leads into environment painting, which will then turn into, I guess you could quickly move into design, and you can kind of go either way. After that point, when you have these worked out, you get into keyframes and concepts. So, what is it made out of? What is.
Environmental sketching is a collection of perspective skills, observation, construction, and let's say remixing. So all of these are foundational and this comes from using and understanding reference. No problem, Emil. Okay. So, if we want to get started in environment sketching, we want to build up our familiarity with dynamic sketching. What this means is all of the fundamentals. So boxes, cylinders, and primitives. For those in the Discord who see my little notes sheet, I'm going to be kind of recreating that from scratch. Maybe a little more detail if any of you guys have questions, but it's all fairly simple as well. So understanding boxes and cylinders, that's going to be kind of an over, uh, overview of basic fundamental skills for those of you that are new or watching for the first time. When you draw a box, you want to have a horizon line. A box exists within, I guess it doesn't even necessarily exist within horizon lines, but boxes have vanishing points. So if you have a square, these lines are going to continue infinitely. What happens when you want to introduce more sides? There's a third dimension, so there's going to be another set of lines. By doing that, you have to have three points that will all go off in various directions. When using a box, there's key things that we need to be able to understand. I'm not going to necessarily teach them here, but I'm going to cover them. There's stuff like basic primitive manipulation. If you have a box, you need to be able to understand how to shear it, which would be to remove uh, geometry in order to make something different. Hey Harim, don't worry, you're not actually that late. So if you had a box and you want to make a new piece of geometry in it, to help yourself out you can kind of have like a, a map telling you where things are. So if I want to take off this corner and bevel it, I can remove that corner from the side and then extend 
those points to the same vanishing point. I should not have rotated that much. Sorry, guys. By extending it, you can end up with a new box that has its own shape. And what if you want to add on geometry? That's also simple. You can put in something like a new square, follow the vertical, What we're doing here is that this is following the same vanishing points as the rest of the box that's already established. So manipulating, removing, and adding new geometry isn't a crazy thing to wrap your head around. It's, it's essentially just mapping new shapes that you want within a box. And that's why boxes are so important is so that you can understand the basic foundational building blocks of how to construct your own scenes from scratch. Okay. Last thing would be rotation, and I go over rotation in a YouTube video that I've made before, but if you had a box head-on and you imagined it along a horizon line, these points are going infinitely in one direction, and if we're looking at it head-on, then its back points are going back this way, like one point perspective. If you want to introduce the second side here, then you're going to need to rotate it. But how do you do that? Well, you want to see all of this side, which means that this dot needs to come out some in order for you to start seeing what's behind it. Which would mean that, let's extend this. Whatever was previously behind it, that dot is now going to position itself over here. These lines will follow it. And then the lines that were over here I'm going to say shorter, but it basically means like the vanishing point. Let's scoot this over. the vanishing point now moves closer. So all of the vanishing points have shifted to the right. I'll quit using red maybe, it's pretty neon. So that's basic rotation, and there are good cheats that you can get around with cylinders. Cylinders basically work by having one axis, one side that is close to us is perpendicular, and the other side will stay on that axis and because you can see more of it, it is going to be wider in degree. But maybe not that wide. Even connect them. The farthest ellipse is always uh, wider in degree, just so you know.
If you want to rotate, it can be as simple as understanding the width of the ellipses. So if you have a line, a thin ellipse, slightly wider, That is how you rotate that. It's a shorthand for basically no space, wider space, wider, wider, and widest. You can use that shorthand in order to basically have a minor axis in any direction, and by establishing a width of degree, you can set up basic rotation. There are some things to understand about foreshortening in general, but it's something that you can also pick up over time. A good exercise for, base, for working your way around rotation is to draw like a wheel axis and this kind of acts as your playground that you are playing within. If I have a line going this way you can see exactly how both the foreshortening is going to work within this whole thing because this side is narrower than this side slightly and you're also going to get m multiple sides of the same orientation of cylinder so we're looking at this one head on it's too narrow That means this one is going to be really wide when we look at it. Almost a circle. Yes, I do cheat with the custom shape tool quite often. I don't always get it right. Like there, for instance. You know, I accidentally, not accidentally, the band Three Doors Down played on my computer the other day. And I thought that was a blast of the past. We'll just erase some of this stuff that makes it a little more confusing. If anyone has questions, you can speak up, and you can also talk amongst yourselves. Chances are, I'll re-record audio or shorten the creation process in the eventual videos. Okay, 
that covers that. Then let's talk about objects repeating in perspective. Objects that repeat in perspective are defined by, I don't know the actual name off the top of my head. Let's call it, <laughs> I don't know, linear scaling, linear regression, I guess, I don't know. It's this idea that um, things kind of exponentially decrease in size as they recede in perspective. And this is covered in Scott Robertson's How to Draw. So. The basic idea is if you have a plane in perspective, you can follow it to its vanishing point and then find the intersection of the two, take that vanishing point, draw a line through the intersection, and then this becomes a target for you to hit from the nearest far corner. Let's use normal black again. immediately the size is reduced by more than half and it is perfectly I guess parallel or right next to the previous object in perspective so it's a common mistake when people are sketching environmentally to think that uh, things will be pretty close in size it's determined by the um, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for for how wide your lens is, which is basically how close your vanishing point is to being on the page, on the canvas itself. The farther away it is, the more similar things will stay uh, in size because the perspective is not changing much. But if you have a wide lens or a nearby vanishing point, like this one does, you're going to have that regression and scale happen very quickly. And the same hap the same goes for figures. So if you have a little figure and he's got a leg, You follow him back to the vanishing point, and you can also reduce his scale. Now, so long as you move an object along an like a horizontal vanishing point, that scaling will remain the same. Ah, crap. Procreate crashed. I don't really dislike that it does that. There must be something about this stick figure of it it does not like because it doesn't want to move him. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, never mind. We just won't see that example. Can't move it. And lastly, it, it goes for defining perspective and any orientation. Any object can have its own perspective.
It doesn't matter how you draw it, so long as you have two lines converging to a single point, that acts as a vanishing point, and that acts as a perspective guideline for an object. You could, you know, you could feasibly add another point and that will recede in another direction and then you could establish your main shape and mirror that as well. Okay. Next, we will go over, this is especially now, people can just talk with me because I'm just going to be drawing and it's going to be uh, dynamic sketching of things that are found in environments. Things found in environments. Organics. So trees, rocks, clouds. man-made architecture and figures for this class we will not be prioritizing figures But let's go over, uh, this is also a progression of easy to hard. Let's go over organic sketching. Is there any sort of organic that anybody usually has issues with, issues with drawing? Am I live still? I don't know. Oh, whoops, I had my, my mic muted, muted sorry. sorry. Um, uh, you mentioned trees, that's a good one that's tough for me. Okay, okay, cool. So let's see. I'll pull up. You'll think I'm crazy, but I'm using Edge Browser because I have stuff in my normal browser related to work, and that's under contract to not be revealed. So I don't know, let's go to Google. Tree. <laughs> Wow, this, how deep does this rabbit hole go? Uh, there's some good images, though. Well. 
Pinterest is very good. I, I would recommend it. I was against Pinterest until I signed up and then I thought and then I saw oh okay I get it this makes sense because all it does is suggest you more pictures that look like the thing that you were just looking for so if you treat it like Google it'll just show you more stuff better than Google will but yeah it's very great okay that's a good one I didn't expect these to be entire galleries of trees. Some really cool ones, though. There, I clicked on one, and I just wanted the one that I clicked on. Yeah. <laughs> Took so long. Let's see. Okay. So trees. Trees are cylinders. You can start a tree either with a graphic shape. primitive. So you could just draw something like that and then you can find your perspective in it. Or you can start with a primitive, like so. Let's reduce that size. It's important to look at both. Because trees are graphic elements, but they also have form to them. And so it, it's just important to recognize form in all cases. Uh, for the tree on stream, you should see that there is a short stocky base and so I'm looking at that graphic shape and I'm seeing stuff like how there are overlaps which are basically their own cylinders or cones and they overlap in form. Then there's going to be variations in the, fo the form of the tree itself. So here, as it goes up, it gets narrower. It also has a bump because it's got this little cylinder coming off of it. This branch goes off in this direction. If you think of it as a cylinder, you can do that. And then start designing its shape graphically
add these contours because they can help us define extra cylindrical forms on the tree itself. Then it's just a matter of drawing. You take those principles, you extend them to anything that you want. You can foreshorten a cylinder so that it comes this way before going in another direction. If you want to do overlaps, you can shoot a branch off in this direction. If you think about the cylinder closing off and there being another cylinder behind it, then you can draw that one and you can have these kind of overlapping zigzags that show depth very easily. When it comes to drawing the, the leaves, you want to contain them in graphic shapes. So clearly the one in the picture is just, it's a whole mess of leaves and I'm not gonna deal with that. But if you had large graphic shapes that were designed like so, you basically already have the tree. And then it comes into filling it, so if you want some basic leaf detail you can either break silhouette You can bring it in as well to show some overlaps, so. And if you want to have tree branches that are not, uh, you know, visible from the front, you can kind of, you can erase some, just erase in various places, and imagine covering them up with leaves from any, either direction. I still struggle with that myself, personally, honestly. Look, that's, that even that's a mess. Don't listen to that. Bad tip. But that's where we're going to go with a basic tree. How far can we shrink this before it's unlegible on stream? Yeah. 
if we wanted to go over, let's see, this tree, for example, is a good understanding of how the roots work. So big base, you've got these shapes coming out. All of these are cylindrical forms. If you want to go over twisting, give ourselves a little more space for this. Twisting is where you have a box and you want to Ooh, that's not how that works. <laughs> Let, let's think through this again. Okay. Um. My god, I just forgot how to do it. Okay. I do know that a normal tree, or a normal tree twist, is going to have an overlap like this. Basically, what you're looking for are T shaped overlaps. Okay, so We'll call that good on trees. Next, let's cover some clouds. And hey to those in the YouTube stream. I see some comments coming in, so nice to see you guys. Thanks for hanging out. I am in the process of making, uh, making lessons, I guess. So you're just watching me create them. It's slow. It takes time. But I figured, you know, this will hold me accountable, and people who watch can learn in real time instead of getting condensed videos. So clouds are, once again, graphic shapes. A graphic shape can be anything. It can be a triangle, it can be big circles, it can be something like this can be anything you want any of those can be a cloud uh, the thing is understanding the forms of your graphic element when designing you want to focus on big medium small So, we have a big circle, then we have a little one, another bigger one, a really thin one, then let's bring it down and shrink it a little bit. So when we look at this, we got big shape, medium shape, small shapes.
if you want to look to create the form in this, you focus on geometry and overlap. And simply by having this one come in front of the other, you have an immediately you immediately have the illusion of depth by overlapping one cloud in front of the next one. The geometry that I'm talking about would be the fact that this is a spherical form. The same goes for, um, let's see, the fact that clouds have an underside. To think about this, we can think about a box. When I draw a shape in this box, a big shape, a little shape, a medium, and some smalls, I have to think about this underside. And if I wanted to, I could bring this down and I could kind of map out how this would look in that perspective. It doesn't actually have to be accurate, that's the beauty of clouds. And let's fill this in with just a light value. So important to think about that, you can also have something like this big shape and then whoa, add a vanishing or add a vertical vanishing point to it and then that's another big cloud on its own right there. But I'm going to remove that because it doesn't look as good. Okay, anybody have any questions on clouds before I move on? I'll just cover some quick stylization. Uh, stylization 
in clouds would be something like ultra simplification or really focusing on the graphic element rather than the form which would be maintaining realism like what if I wanted to have a really triangular cloud what would that look like It could be, in the right context, this could be a cloud. Or you could have a big box cloud. With its own little boxes in it. And lastly, a circle cloud. All of those can be clouds painted or drawn in the right context. It's really up to you. Next, we will go over. Let's see. Talk about some grass. I think any time I look up grass, I'm not going to get what I need. This is decent. This has a few elements that we need. Mountains, rocks, and grass. So a rock is a box, like everything else in this world. This is why we must sacrifice to our box gods in order to be blessed in return. A rock is a box with multiple points of geometry. So if you wanted to, this is how I go about it, start with a graphic shape. Let's use the one that's here on reference, for example. That, is, that can be a rock, certainly can. By keeping its edges uh, firm, it reads as one. And then you can connect points in between. Bam, rock. You can go crazy.
And how would we decorate this out? Well, let's add medium shape here. Let's add some small ones here. Let's make it a donut. So what do we know about forms? We know that a donut is a cylindrical thing, but we want this to mix with firm edges. So add some planar geometry to it. Oh, snap. Just like that, you got a crazy rock. So with rocks covered, we can introduce grass. On YouTube, Haster asked if I could make uh, some lessons about the basics of human anatomy. Uh, I won't be doing that because I am not a character designer, first, primarily, and I have a lot of knowledge that I can share on environments and keyframe design. And uh, so I'm going to be focusing on that for the next few months. So if we have a rock, notice that I'm still focusing on big, medium, small elements. We can integrate grass blades. By adding this to things like the edges, you can easily show grass just by kind of being dumb and frivolous about it. What you want to avoid is drawing every blade of grass in a field. So if you have this, and you have a nice body of water, and some rocks, and you don't want to go in and draw all of these little tick marks 
and you know all of that to show detail don't do that instead you can show grass in the foreground So what, what's the difference going on here? We are uh, designing coherent groups. That's the most important aspect, is this is a group. This is a group. This shape here is a group. So when you collect things all together and make them look intentional, you get a better result. Whoops. If anybody has questions, feel free to ask. And then let's uh, see about some mountains. Like everything else so far, this is a graphic element, and I think I'm even realizing about this as I'm saying this is that since nature is undefined, uh, we get to define it. So environments are inherently designable because it doesn't matter what a mountain or a rock or a blade of grass looks like as long as it sort, sort of resembles the real thing. But even then, who's to say that you aren't making an alien world? And so anything organic can form in basically any sort of designed way. If you have a mountain, you want to focus on overlaps. Um, let's see, I don't have much to add about mountains other than 
think of the form. This right here is a T overlap. T overlaps are really good at, for one, showing overlap and helping describe separation of, let's see, foreground and background. By putting one line in front of the other, you can separate it and say this is a new object without having to go so far as to use value. Um, so it's very important to keep those in mind. Maybe we'll go over water another time, but I don't have great tips for drawing water. try some stuff here. So, water. When you draw water, if we have some basic Okay, so what I'm doing here is drawing a scene because we want to be able to reflect it. And just to save time, I'm going to copy all this. See if this works, because I am technically trying this on the cuff. One, I'm going to reduce the line weight because it is not the real object. And then two, I'm going to focus on uh, adding ripples. So then breaking things apart.
Okay, that is my attempt. <laughs> so what am I trying to do here? Let's thicken this up one last time. ripples if you think about a plane in perspective let's let's draw a ripple first Ripples will recede in perspective. So I have a big ripple shape, wider at least. Whereas this is going to be much thinner. Um, let's see. You want to mirror places of density. So by doing that, uh, it kind of resembles the original shape of what's on the ground. And lastly, higher density of ripples in the distance. Okay, that's water. We are an hour and 20 minutes in. And so far, I think things are going well. How are things going on your end, you guys? Is this all right? Okay, I got a response of a thumbs up. Again, feel free to talk verbally if you have a microphone, if you would like to. Okay, so we'll get into basic man-made stuff. The point is we need to be able to draw it. <laughs> That would mean something like, I don't know, let's look up a historical building, see what we get.
in environment design will often be making you know fancy things fancy man-made architecture this is a good one Hey Spud, yeah, this is being recorded. I plan on, this is the creation process of my lessons. So eventually these will be condensed down for YouTube or re-released on Gumroad. Architecture is a collection of forms that help define style. This can be otherwise known as form language. So let's look at a Scotland estate. We've got, I'm just going to roughly Go over the shape here and not worry about the construction too much. I really am fighting the urge to sing <laughs> while doing these recordings. It's something that I do naturally. It's just, I feel empty air. But the reason I'm not doing it is because I might try to use these. Anyone who buys this in the future will hear me saying this now, but I don't want to sing into people's ears. While I'm trying to teach him stuff. Although Nick is telling me to do it. It's tempting. It really is. So what is this form language? We have cones and cylinders. 
And they define, let's say, 20% of this building. The rest would be box-like. Seventy percent, and then circle facade motifs ten percent. So cones, cylinders, boxes. and then circle motifs. If we were to remix this, Let's see if I can just design a silhouette off the cuff, see what happens. Okay, we want a box to be 70%. We're gonna have a big box. And I want it to be really big here, little wings on the side with other decently sized rooms on the opposing wings. Let's go with that. I want to have smaller cones here. One big cone. Supported by two there. So this can be a main entrance, and these can be additional entrances. Then we'll fill in our windows. <laughs> Arctic Monkey on YouTube says, I'm streaming now? Epic gaming moment. <laughs> you know, I, I, I like to uh, keep up with video games. And while I don't really play them that much, anymore because I have to focus on other things. Not many people know this about me, but I was a community mod on the Game Informer blog section back in uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> was, yeah. I got a blast from the past when I saw my Steam page the other night. I was loading up Halo Infinite and I saw that I had someone post on my main page from Game Informer. It said nine years ago. I thought, oh my god. It's nine years ago? That was in the same decade? I couldn't believe it. I've done a lot in these nine years. I 
at Game Informer, I wrote about 120 different pieces, 120 blog posts. And I became a community mod. Uh, the writers featured me a couple times, the main Game Informer writers. After that, I moved on to music production. And I was, I played trombone in high school and stuff too, so. Then I picked up the drums and played in a group band in college. Participated in racquetball in the official competition leagues in college. <laughs> Got pretty good. <laughs> Started learning guitar and bass. Now we're doing art. So. This would be a visual remix. I'm taking this visual language and incorporating it into something new. wonder this procreate stream okay it doesn't look weird anymore okay I don't have much more to say on architecture but we can sketch out something that would be more difficult for contrast let's pick something like I don't know something Maybe difficult? Norse building? It's not difficult, but it's got interesting shapes. Still looking. This is interesting. I guess I should really just pick one. Someone, someone suggest me a building style because I'm not seeing anything that I want to draw. Someone do it. Nick might have something. For people on YouTube, if you jump into my Discord, you can communicate with me directly. Okay, we'll just go with Americana. I cannot think of anything else. When we are drawing stuff, uh, so let's talk about constructing a building. All that talk about graphic elements in organics could still hold a place here, but I'm going to avoid that for the time being because that's a little high level and we want to stick to things that we can understand uh, when we construct things out of basic building blocks. 
maybe you have designed a house. Let's say I'm going to base it off of this house that we have in the reference. Then let's see, it continues to go down, has some overlap, because there is a garage here. <laughs> Arctic on YouTube says, me talking about my history is my, my dark past. I guess so. I don't talk about it too much, I guess. Okay, so there is a house. If you wanted to move this to perspective, well, for one thing, we have a reference in front of us, but let's say that you were designing something and you wanted to build it from the ground up. You might have to imagine what it would be like behind the front silhouette. And better to cover this now rather than to only have it once later on is we can start with a ground plane or yeah let's do both. Let's start with I have a box And I know that this building is going to come out like this. You can then extrude this upwards and down. If this is a ground plane, then we have their little bed of plants So there you go. That building was constructed from the ground up. Imagined as if it were in perspective. Okay, a simpler solution, but we don't really need to think about it too much right now, is floor plan, copy, move into perspective.
BAM building. Oh snap! Don't do that right now for perspective kiddos because you need to learn your construction. In fact, I shouldn't even mention it at all. <laughs> okay. So, I think we are nearing all that I had bought to do. Uh, so let's go over... I'll introduce, like, assignments to think about. And next time, I don't know that I'll necessarily grade them, but I could certainly review some for critique and the tail end of the next time I do a lesson. But right now, let's do, like, general Q&A. If anybody has questions before I'm done for this week. Now is your time. We covered. Give you guys some time to think. Primitives. We covered organics and we covered man-made architecture uh, I guess we haven't covered how to draw something in a scene or just in general how to approach drawing something from reference so we can still do that Looks like Spud has got a question he's going to type up. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the notes of everything I do for sure. Uh, let's see. I don't know why I forgot to do something as basic as drawing a reference. Let's find something fun. Still looking. Oh, hey, Gans, Brian is in the chat. How you doing, my bud? Hey, uh, hello. Hey there. Yeah, feel free hey, to talk. Yeah. All right, so, hey, I don't know if this is too advanced for this class, but how exactly would you, or, or like some pointers on how would you set up the perspective if you want to achieve a certain camera angle? That I, I am going to cover in subsequent lessons, but we, we can cover it quickly here as well. So the question right, cool. is... Uh, and for Brian, I'm glad you made the tail end. I'm happy you're here. Uh, so question is how to decide perspective for an image you want? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So deciding the perspective for an image that you want is going to be very situational. And there are going to be a lot of things that you'll want to get under your belt before I think you would really be comfortable making that decision. But in general, we have one point, two point, and three point. All of these have purposes. in terms of cinematic language.
Now, when you're thinking about what they all do, and I will explain that in much more depth later on, uh, you are going to want to study uh, frames from movies. and break down their perspective. But let's say you want an establishing shot. I'm going to make all this smaller. An establishing shot in concept art or film is showing a location, uh, school grounds photo. It's showing a location before you get into the up close and personal of the, of the movie, right? So you might have this shot of the library that people are going into, and that's a three-point perspective. It could also be a two-point perspective if you wanted things to be more still. So two point allows you to have a horizon line, point over here, point over here, and you've got a building. So you can define it this way. You can always look to reference to help you, and if you know the kinds of shots that you want to go for. Establishing shots can also be bird's eye views, or aerials. School, grounds, and drone shot. And once again, that is a three-point perspective with the horizon line all the way up there. Everything is running up towards that horizon line, and the vanishing point is going down. So with the school grounds, you've got the whole campus. You've got paths. Parking lot. Bye, Bo. I'm glad you were able to hang out. If you wanted something that was like symmetrical, you wanted a building that was symmetrical, you might pick one point. This way you can have a horizon line and a building and everything that's in it. gets pulled in like so. Exactly, this is Wes Anderson style. Everything he does is basically in one point. It creates a, a very graphic look because you're getting the front design of everything and you can make things much more purposeful this way. Whereas in more perspective oriented styles, it is descriptive rather than graphic is how I would say. So these are just, these are all three different ways to approach the same intent cinematically. You want to have an establishing shot, but how do you pick what type of perspective you want to do? It doesn't really matter, it's up to you. And if you start to build the cinematic language of what you're going for, you can pick and choose the type of shot that you're going to do. Um, 
good learning material. All right, got it, got it. Thank you, that, that was great. Is, yeah, happy to help. Studio Binder. YouTube. Studio Binder is a channel that goes over all of the different types of techniques for cinema, like how to do blocking, how to do staging, how to pick different shots and sweeps. And for any visual artist, especially if you're going to get into storytelling, which all artists will, uh, you'll want to learn about the language of film. So definitely good to start looking into that early. Um, okay. We'll finish off with some environment sketching from reference. Okay, so everyone sees this Pacific Northwest reference here, right? I am going to work with this. And let's see. I'm not going to base it entirely off of what we're doing here. Like, it's still going to be totally based off of it, but my aspect ratio is different. And I don't want people to get the idea that they need to be totally focused on replication rather than application of concepts. So, when you start with a sketch, you want to start with a horizon line. This horizon line is going to be used to define perspective. When it's in a big landscape like this, how do you define perspective? There's nothing to really show you. And that is perfectly okay. You can just do a generic one point because again every object has its own vanishing points within 3d space regardless do not marry yourself to the idea that everything in a two-point or three-point environment must be uh, adhering to the original grid that you set up uh, perspective starts wide and exponentially gets thinner so That is a basic ground plane. And I'll reduce that down. Within this space that we have here, we have this lake. Notice that I'm not placing it on the horizon line because it's not on the horizon. The mountain is behind it, and there is even more land behind that. So what I want to do is create overlap of land, which is why I put this little thing here, because I'm already imagining that this is going to be its own landmass with another landmass of that lake behind it. This one goes up quite a bit. Uh, beyond that we would have this mountain and let's see I'm going to try and stylize this not stylize it but I'm going to group its shape uh, this is basics of environment sketching design so when I look at this mountain I see this big commanding shape and I want a little bit of this to lead up to it. Some overlap would be nice. And then when I talk about addressing this foreground, I want to make sure that the foreground feels the, wi feels the widest because it's closest to us, and that the lake, even though it's big, is still going to be narrow. So I'm not going to try to flatten out the perspective. I'm going to try to keep it like this. So notice that this, if this was one big space, this is like a 60, this is like a 40. 
You could have a smaller foreground. It's up to you. And this would be its own foreground with plants and stuff. But that's for however you think of that and what you would want to do in the future. So with this, we have some things to address. For one, we need to detail out the mountain. Two, we need to think about how we're going to approach sketching trees. Three, we have a lot of foreground elements with a lot of noise, and we don't necessarily know how to address them. The answer to all of this is grouping shapes. Simplification to basic rudimentary graphic elements. When we talk about these trees, what we see is basically, okay, I've got this landmass here, this landmass here. Both of these are contained within the original shape that I did, so I'll reduce that down even still. And then we've got trees. So we've got some that are like this. I'll do I'll simplify by skipping some trees. We've got one in the foreground that is going to be very big. And let's make it off kilter just a little bit so we can But in general, everything that I draw is going to be contained within this major mass that I drew. Because I wanted to start with the overall graphic shape, which is going to group these trees together. Then for anything that is on the ground, landmass, I'll have groups of bushes and then just kind of draw other ones that are around it but they're thinner. And I'll do the same with the trees on the left. We've got this major shape. So I have trees. Another shape within it. And this is all masses. And even beyond behind that, there is another shape of trees in this area that are smaller, and they don't go beyond their plane. When we are going to deal with a foreground, we want to see, OK, we've got this tree, I'm going to place it here. And I'm going to design it just a little bit. Because it's presumably a bit of a focal element. We've got 
this shape of dark shrubbery. This shape of yellow shrubbery. And let's see, this one comes out like so. Yeah. So all of those are going to be group shapes. And when I draw into them, I'll draw my details. I need to be on a new layer. So it's a small little tiny tree for whatever reason. Who knows why it's here? I don't. We got this foreground plant shape right next to it. So imagining that. I'll add that there. When you erase it, it's its own little small shrub. We've got, how are you going to address all this red and dark shrubbery. We've got this dividing line here, another shape of plants there, another shape of plants here, and those would be the groups of sh shapes within this major mass. So I'll break it out some and I will draw some little twiggy twigs then go over here and just ignore that. I don't need to do every detail to imply that there is mass here. I want to draw some more plants here because it's about picking places of detail, places of rest. If you group things together, then people will say, oh, okay, so it's all part of the same thing. You don't, they don't need to see every detail. Notice that I'm going back in here to add some larger shapes that have more thickness to them. Uh, again, I want to try and remember big, medium, small. So throwing in stuff every once in a while that feels like it is breaking out organically is going to help. Then if we look at this selection here, that is like a bush mass. What I want to do first is uh, draw the plants that are in front of it. So we've got these plants that overlap this plant, or those, those bushes, with their own sort of just 
wispy grass. This is going to get chaotic real quick because I am not the best at managing all of this and I'm probably going to have to revise things as we get really detailed and see how we can break it down. F for one, I'm going to I'm going to break around, I'm going to break some of these lines. Get rid of the perspective. Reduce fat. Okay. And now let's address this bush. If we treat it as one large mass, just like this, then we don't need to go crazy with details. We'll just give some information about silhouette. We'll break it up some. Okay. Bye, Harim. Happy to have you along. And then for the sake of visual clarity, I'm only going to do some slight noisy breaks here. Throw some overlapped so we can see that there's still land behind this tree. Hopefully this is going somewhere okay. Last, we will address the mountain. I don't know why the stream has this bad looking artifacting on the background. If I change that, okay. This mountain has We'll go with this shape, this shape, we'll throw in a small, then a big, then a medium, small, Let's bring this around so that they're not just both receding. And then let's talk about showing form. This major shape would be like this. And I'm only going to separate it by breaking this up. That would be a snow shape there. 
we've got this area that would be a snow shape what I'm trying here is I'm drawing in a big container and then erasing negative space and just thinking about uh, I don't want to go outside of those shapes because I would be losing the grouping and the intention of the design I'm going to put this shape, I'm going to group things in here as one major piece, and then with all of that, I'll just start forming geometry. then these mountains here are calmer and they're just going to have some basic overlaps. So if we wanted to sketch in the water, I'm not going to go crazy with it. I'm just going to go off of what they have here which is dark shadow shapes where light is being blocked and I'm not going to mass it all in, just focus on the outline We're close to finishing this up, but it's still really noisy, and that's my own fault. If I did this better, it wouldn't be as noisy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean things up. You can get away with a lot as long as you have occasional silhouette breaks, you can straighten things out. And I have to remind myself of this on my own, clearly. But as long as you show the occasional overlap, you can get away with your tree. What I want to do is get rid of all this unnecessary clutter and not connecting major shapes. We can also clean things up retroactively with line weight, which I am going to do for sure.
Does anybody have any questions of what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do? Hey, there. Uh, yeah, so that cleaning up process we're doing, is that something that you just develop and, and it's only intuition or does it have a name that someone can look up and learn from? This is something that I'm doing by intuition. I'm looking around and I'm deciding what is too messy, what has a lot going on, and I'm trying to get rid of the stuff that I think doesn't need to be there anymore. What was the stuff that I added in that I really shouldn't have? And this is going to come through a lot of careful observation of looking at other artists and seeing how they address simplification. It's really difficult. I struggle with it every time I try to sketch something. But eventually, yes, you will build up your intuition. Okay, so I clean things up a little bit. And the last way that we can make this more legible is by doing a final pass of thickening up line weights. do it with some of these plants here. I'm basically connecting them. Feltrucci, another thing, if that's how you pronounce your username, another thing that I am looking for in this cleanup process is it's not just unnecessary noise that I drew in, but it's me looking at my shapes, my, my groups. So I've got this, and I see this line that is passing through like this. I want to help get rid of unnecessary stuff or if I have stuff I want to kind of move it along this this uh, group line so it's going by doing this it's going to make things look more controlled right I see And hopefully that that controls uh, where the eye is looking and isn't getting lost with all of the crazy details that I put in that I shouldn't have put in to begin with, but I was really tr just happy to kind of <laughs> try to show you guys how to simplify things. So back to thickening line weight.
I'll focus on adding a little bit of underside to some things. Just I'm not really thinking about it. I'm just using the lines as noise and texture. The reason that the noise works in this case, granted it's up to you if it does work, is because it's within the shape. It's within the design group. So I can come in here. I can add some darkness and depth to these things. Uh, for, for example, like what do you mean that the line weight is within the noise is within the shape? The the uh, the leaf shapes that I drew. These guys. I I'm drawing the black dark noise, all of these lines, but I am drawing them within the shapes that I did. So while it's noisy, it's relatively okay because it's still within the leaf shape that I drew. Um, okay, okay, got it. Yeah. And again, it's a taste thing also. Like, you might think this looks really bad. I don't think it looks great, I'll tell you that, <laughs> but I'm kind of trying to remember what I had learned and how this was managed. Uh, Okay, so that would be an environment sketch. The last thing that we could do would be to just add some value to it. And it can be as simple as light in the background, dark in the foreground. That is not a rule that happens all of the time it's just an easy way for you to, it's called massing, uh, putting together large groups of shapes for visual clarity. Oops. I didn't do what I wanted to do. Wow, and then it just... Okay. Okay, one quick question. When, when can that rule of, of massing, of like having the background lighted and the foreground be successfully broken? 
When can it be successfully what? Sorry. Broken or how? Okay. That is, it's a high level concept, which would be um, staging your values early on and thinking about whether you are going to be staging your values based off of the inherent local value of your objects or by lighting. And this concept is called Notan versus Chiaroscuro. And Notan is using flat value to design shape. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking while I'm drawing. The other would be lighting, where you can mass your shapes together however you want. So lighting is very easy to do it with because you can basically make everything dark and light it all after the fact and just say, yep, this is how the light is, this is how it exists, and I'm going to keep it that way. But if you don't want to do it with lighting, then you have to do it with, like in the case of a, um, what is it called? An overhead, or overcast day. You would have values that are more true to what they actually are. So you would focus on their local value, no tan, which I will do here. Okay, so there is a basic environment sketch. Um, here it's a no tan setup because I just have basic values. They're not lit in any way. They're only slightly indicative. They indicate the original value that was in the reference. Um, let's see. Any other questions that you might want to have? I'll do one last, I'm, I'm not going to have it take forever like this one did. But I'll do one more. And what I'm going to do here is, let's say we have a building. We want that building. We've got low horizon line building with shapes. Let's 
Let's make it smaller. It's, not, it's definitely not in perspective. Uh, let's see. Ooh, this is, I shouldn't have done this, everyone. LOL. Okay, never mind. <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to show was how to demonstrate, like, sketching from imagination. But, one, I didn't show you process very well. And two, I did not have something in mind before doing this, and I didn't set up. I wasn't careful with my uh, vanishing points for any of the man-made architecture. So it's all kind of just a mess. I will scrap this. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. We might, if anyone can think of one building that they would like to see drawn, I can look up that reference and I'll just do that process again. I'll try it one more time. One. I think, actually, we might just cut it off there. How about that? <laughs> one mediocre environment sketch and one failure. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. I've got work to do. And you guys can let me know if this was successful. In the next session, let's look at what I had. After this, 
we're going to go over compositional rules of perspective and how to put together scenes with primitives. So basic uh, composing of primitives in one area in order to come up with a scene from imagination. That is the first goal to get to. And if anybody wants to do homework, then I would just say uh, homework would be You're welcome, guys. I'm happy to do it. Uh, organic sketching. Ten sketches. Five ultra simplified. stylized plus organic then let's say man-made hey I wasn't for the first part of the, of the stream so uh, what is organic sketching like what, what you did first the uh, the one, the, the note on sketch you, you just did? Uh, no, and I'll, I'll share the notes as well, but it would be drawing organic objects. So clouds, trees, water. All right, cool, thanks. Mountains. Man-made would be buildings. Any architecture. And then one form language analysis, which I have the notes on, so I will share it, which will become one, remi one building remix, which is reapplying the form language of a building that you studied to make a new one using similar elements. Then, let's say three perspective breakdowns. Of images you like. And all that is, is taking a picture and just understanding that the horizon line is down here, the vanishing point goes over there, it's a two-point perspective, yada yada. Do that three times just so you can see how photos and scenes are built. And then do three environment studies. Focus on grouping shapes and avoid visual clutter. Okay. Yeah, but the ultra simplified stylized sketches would be stuff like these clouds here. I would think taking it from a reference and stylizing it hardcore would be best rather than just designing it yourself because then you are taking it from something real and you're, you're editing it down. So I'll just do that real, real quick, super duper simple, 
again so that is big circle I like this idea of kind of adding some hard edges to it then That would be like an ultra, that would be what I would define as an ultra simplified sketch. Instead of trying to draw a cloud with the details that you see, which I would also encourage, this would be stylizing it in a way that is not grounded in reality. So you are taking big leaps with it, I guess. Okay, that makes everything for this session. I appreciate you guys hanging out. And I will talk to you again later. I'm going to stop streaming now. I'll still be talking. <laughs>